This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew McKay-Smith. G'day, everybody. Hope you're well. I've got an episode to share with you that I've been looking forward to doing so for many years. This one features a conversation with the very legendary Shane Embry from Napalm Death. Now, the catalyst for the conversation is due to an Australian tour that's happening throughout September 2023. If you're local, do check gig guides for that one. I should say that they're touring with Wormrot as well, so it's another reason to go along to the shows if you're local. Now, importantly, in this conversation here, we touch on many subjects that are all wrapped up in the legacy of Napalm Death and Shane's involvement in extreme metal. So too many topics of conversation to talk about in the introduction here, but yeah, this conversation is well worth listening to. In addition, to topics to do with work-life balance and family. It was really interesting to hear Shane's thoughts on that topic there. So a very well-rounded chat to share with you. Here he is, the great Shane Embury. Here he yes. is. How, how are you, mate? Good, mate. How are you doing? Yeah, not bad, not bad. Thanks for taking the time out to talk to us uh, indie journo types. You know we appreciate it. <laughs> That's all good, man. All good, all good. Yeah. No problem. How's the? Uh, have you do you enjoy doing this sort of thing, these sort of zoomers and stuff? Um, uh, you know what, mate. I took a funny enough during when the when the album came out. Throws we're in the pandemic and like any like many people, I was I was I don't know. I was having a strange time, you know, dealing with uh, being at home so much at, the, at that point. Anyway, and I didn't I, did, I didn't really do any do much press for for throws because it was kind of I, I felt I, I felt like lyrically. Mm. It, it, thematically, it was Barney's trip, you know, mm. and I sort of so. And I, it's always sometimes a bit difficult when people say, "Okay, well, what's the lyrics about?" And of course, you know, but you didn't completely write them, you know. Yeah. So I sort of took, took a break. But then uh, having that break um, and doing whatever the hell I do musically, I suppose it's, it's given me a bit of a. I don't know what you call it. You take a break and you go, "All right, now I'm ready to, to talk about stuff." You know, not that not that I'm, you know. It, Am I saying anything that's that important? I hope so. Who knows? But it's but it's just like, you know, you like to feel sometimes you can get a bit like overwhelmed by the the I mean because we just I, I, I at the time just done like so many so many songs musically. And it was mm. I was kind of drained from that. And I thought, well, it's your barn your turn. <laughs> anyway, yeah. you know, but um, uh this has been good today. Today's today's been fun. You know, I've right. enjoyed it. Yeah, you, you've been doing this as long as anybody in extreme metal, okay? So do you find that the quality of journalism, I mean, I am a journalist, I went to uni and became a journalist, and, and so hopefully that comes across during our chat. But <laughs> I've got to say, I've listened to some of the chats that you've been a part of, and I, I don't think people take the time out to listen to other interviews to ask you uniquely interesting questions at times. And it's not just you, it's you know, Barney too and Bill Steer and all of the guys that have had such a rich and steep history in this genre here, but do you find that? Sometimes you know you you can have one as you can have one interview where you're really getting and it will depend of course on you yourself and how, and how you feel that day. But um, yeah, sometimes um, when you I think when you're facing interviews where there's been no research at all, mm. you know it, 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 it puts you in a, puts you in a, in a situation where you go, I don't want to be cheeky here, but you know. Uh, you know what, what? What do I? How do I answer this? Really, um, or whatever. So it's for the course, you know. But also, um, I realise that well, sometimes they're just starting or they're young or whatever, and you know, yeah. you know. I've been mean, likewise. Am I saying? Hopefully, I'm saying something that's okay. I mean, you, you can you can feel really good at doing an interview, and the next one you can be completely bollocks at it. <laughs> so it's just like what I don't know. That could be like me as well. But there you go. Mm. But yeah, it, it's it, it's um. Uh, especially when you do a lot of lot per day, I suppose you know. Yeah, they build up. It's hard, yeah. to, it's hard, to, it's hard to snap out of interview. My wife always gives me gives me a hard time. She's like, "You're not in a bloody interview now," and I'm like, "That's right, I'm not." Snap, dumb reality. <laughs> so, speaking of family and friends, so I hope you don't mind me asking you a question. But how's Barker going? Uh, he's doing better now. Doing a lot better. Um, he did a tour in the states last year. Napalm Death and Gruhadia, and uh, he was not in a great way um, at all. Um, and 
I don't, that's not, I'm not at liberty to say it's too much, I suppose. Well, actually, probably no, I think no, probably. Uh, but I, I was, I've had a bit of a weird time myself, but not to that degree, I guess. My mm. mum passed, passed away and all, and it, well, you know, Sorry, and yeah. I was just kind of trying, to, trying to deal with, trying to deal with that. And after about 10 years of not drinking, I started drinking and talk again, God knows why. And uh, realized that all of a sudden this thing called anxiety was there, you know. Mm. Um, so, of course, Nick comes on tour and I thought, it really pummeled me. It was one extra thing of, uh, not extra thing, but one, you realize you're getting a hold, you know, and the magnitude of doing what you do. And we, well, you know, we were rages, you know, we, were, we didn't take it easy in our lives, you know. And uh, it's so uh, it's so uh, you navigate the remainder of your life is the thing. But he's doing a lot better, um, which is good. Uh, my family are away visiting my ki- my kids' grandparents in Japan at the moment, so I'm going to hopefully go down and see him. Next week. I saw him a few weeks back. He looked a lot better. I was losing a bit of weight. That's brilliant. So um, I might actually the Bloodstock Festival is in a couple of weeks' time, so I might hopefully catch up with him there. But he's only about an hour away where he lives from me. But he's doing better, which is which is important, you know. Yeah, fantastic news, and God bless to the poor bloke too. Yeah, I know. I think it's uh, look, we all pitched in, meaning all of us fans pitched in, and when the GoFundMe or whatever it was came out there, you know, it's really important. I mean, it's not like musicians have insurance in the same way that us regular working blokes do, is it? No, I think I, I think you sure he probably he, he probably wouldn't he wouldn't say this because I know what he's like. He, uh, mm. he, he wrestled with the. The old concept of it, I suppose, at first, and but you know, um, you know, he's, he's he, he just he just he, he needs he needs some help, and it's, I'm, I'm happy that it, uh, it it's going gone well for him, you know. And uh, me and him are like brothers; we argue like brothers, you know. <laughs> We're very similar in some ways, uh, but we love each other, and um, so I'm, I'm I'm glad that he's he's I'm glad he's doing a lot better because last year I was very I was very worried about him, you know. Yeah, yeah, same here. Look, I, I, I've had uh, a couple of email interactions with him, and and I've spoken to him obviously on the show as well. And uh, I got to know him there a little bit. But after losing Stuart Ansis last year, I thought, "Fucking hell!" Excuse my language, but God, if we lose Nick this time around, um, you know, there's two of that classic cradle of filth lineup. That God, God help me for talking like this about Nick. You know, that he might not be here. He's a strong bastard. We know that. But uh, you know, having kidney failure like that, it's um. He's certainly facing an uphill battle either one. Well, I, I think, um, I think uh, he's uh, through the, through the strength of his of, of his children. You know that, 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 that he's realised that, and we, we like we like we like we. I was tra- we were trying to say that like last year it was like Nick. You know, it's like, we've all led crazy lives. You know with that the, 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 you know we pride and uh, you know we live that kind of metal metal sort of lifestyle, I suppose, or whatever you want to call it, and. Um, it's what you do now. It's where you go from where you, where you go from here, and um, he's doing better, and that's a good thing. And um, he seemed more way. He looked way hundred percent better when I saw him. So, and uh, oh, you just don't know. And you get to this particular age. I mean, I remember. I remember my dad, uh, completely unrelated. You know, his friends pass away, and we live in this time as you get older. You know, um, mm. uh, dealing with death and, and things like that, and it's. It's it's inevitable bar life, you know. Um, but uh, I think he is a strong fucker. Excuse the language, you know what I mean. So he's a uh, be here, I think, for a good 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 time yet. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, you guys have still got to write a lot of music together. And talking about the music, I mean, the reason that we've had this. We've got this opportunity, this catalyst to have a chat. I've really been looking forward to this chat for decades too, Shane. I've got to say I'm a bassist and I've been writing to extreme metal ever since uh, those uh, mid-90s years, being 45 and uh, Inside the Torn Apart and Die Tribes. I mean, they were the albums. That's my era from you guys. That's my entry point. <laughs> and I, I really, I really, enjoy, I still enjoy those albums, by the way. But um, talking about eras, because you do have four or five spread across the band's catalogue, Will you be focusing on any particular era during these shows in Australia that are coming up? Uh, there's a big, there's a good mixture. Uh, it's very difficult uh, given the sort of set length we do, which is around seventy minutes, I suppose, of trying to squeeze it all in. Uh, but it, it's it is a good good cross section of uh, something from words. Uh, we've got something from inside the torn apart. Um, and some diatribes for sure, uh, mixed in with the scum, harmony, corruption, and then some stuff about, yeah, 
quite a bit from the last record, I guess, um, and the mini album. Uh, but there's, there's a good mixture, I hope, you know. Um, it's very difficult as the years go on to sort of pick that set. This, um, and of course, the, you know, the Australia, of course, we only, we only come down every so often, which is, um, you know, that thing, you know. But um, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll, it'll tick the boxes, I hope. Yeah, oh, I'm sure it will, mate. Yeah, I've seen the recent, the more recent live videos, mate. You guys are just as ferocious as ever. I don't know how you guys do it, where you get your bloody energy from. Must be the bananas you're eating or something. <laughs> uh, well, you, you, we uh, sometimes you can be travelling all day, so that one hour is your chance to uh, use some energy somewhere. So you tend to just go for it. It's probably the frustration of being stuck in a bloody van for ten hours driving from one country to the next. You know? You know, but yeah, you know, so that can be that can become a little bit can be a little bit over overbearing. But then you then the gig is like a release. You know, you're like let out of the box. You know, you go. Yeah. Do you, I'll sort of take the conversation in a few different places, if that's okay. I, I, I had a chat to Barney a couple of years ago, and we got into the topic of harmony corruption. Do you do you agree with him in that taking the band to Morrisound that was certainly not a misstep, but maybe the band should have stayed in Britain and got, got a more more grind oriented producer rather than going for that Morris sound on that album? Um, well, what can you say? I mean. The, 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 uh, the, the result of doing that record was that, you know, the old school fans kind of like felt we'd changed or sold out. And then we also <clears throat> gained so many more fans or, or uh, it, it, I don't look, I don't look at the steps of what we did as mistakes at all, because when you're in the midst of it and you're young or whatever, you know, like you, you try to, you like to think you're following your heart. I mean, I can't remember whose idea it really was. It might've been Mickey's. You know, it might have been Dick from Earaches. We, we all loved Death Metal. I mean, Barney, you know, more so than probably anyone really loved Death Metal. Um, loved the Florida bands. We were all vibing on it. You know, um, you know, Barn had this vocal style in, the, in those early days, very really similar to Cam Lee from Massacre a little bit, you know, yeah. in my opinion. Um, Definitely. And we felt, we felt it was a move to do. I mean, I... Also, I was looking forward to hanging out in Florida and watching a lot of my favourite bands rehearse. So, so I, I, I love the experience myself. I just remember me, Jesse, and Mitch driving around in a hired car, blasting it, public enemy. I'd never been to the stage before. It was great, you know, and crashing on bloody Morbid Angels couch and going to see a big show rehearse, an atheist. Uh, we did one show there, I think, with, 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 did we play with atheists and nocturne? It's amazing, you know. I'm and really Scott sure. Burns is an amazingly lovely guy, you know. Um, he had his style, and we did it. Um, musically, it was written, mostly written by Mickey on his two-string guitar. God bless him. And uh, but, I mean, he also wrote a lot of stuff on Mentally Murdered. If it had sounded like Mentally Murdered, people probably wouldn't have uh, batted an eyelid. But mm. I don't regret it. I, I, I loved it. It was great, you know. <laughs> Well, you mentioned God. You mentioned a few people in there, but one of the blokes that I've I always love having this conversation, or at least asking the question about Dig and Earache, because I'm sure you're aware that he's not on the Christmas card list of a lot of bands that have been with um, Earache. So, what, what's your take on the on the Digby experience? Uh, I, I've known Dig since uh, when did I first meet Dig? I think I met Dig at uh, don't know, maybe before. Oh, yeah, I met him in March '86. The Mermaid, when I first saw Nate Bomb Death, um, and spent many time. I, I mean, I used to do mail ads for him, you know, b before he moved to the proper offices. And, you know, I, I've also done a record label short for, for a small period of time. I know how much of a pain in the ass bands can be. Dig, of course. Yeah, he's not everyone's uh, favorite person, really, but um, I can only imagine dealing with the. Well, dealing with some bands can be, but um, lately I've I've I've, I've uh, bumped into him. You know, we say hello, we have a chat, and that's kind of it. You know, you do have moved on. Uh, I haven't anything particularly bad, really, to say about about that relationship because they also certainly in the early years of Napalm. I mean, they, it was you know, it was quite an innovative record label. You know, yeah. I think, but. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't have any feelings either way, really. I'm, just, I'm too too interested in trying to move on through life, really, you know. And um, 
leave it at that, I guess. Um, we're, we're quite cordial to each other when we see each other. You know, that's mm-hmm. about it. That's, that's about the word I'm looking for. You know? Yeah, well, I think he's responsible directly and indirectly in many instances. I mean, look what he did for the American death metal scene when he signed Morbid Angel, for example. There's, well, there's so many I mean, examples I mean, like that. Well, I mean, the thing is, I mean, back in those back in those early days, uh, I think it might have been Mickey that was kind of Mickey pushing him to sign Morbid Angel because uh, you know we 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 were avid tape traders, you know, especially when in two called Nihilist, Bill Steer was probably pushing pushing the envelope there um, and stuff. But, but you know, things changed. You know, I mean, the the whole scene changed when Warren Ellis' the Madness came out for sure. You know, so. Um, mm. He was responsible for things like that. And of course, you know, you have to remember that. And of course, business is business is cannot, business is a pain in the ass, you know, you, whether you want to change or not, when things when things go from that small underground stage to the money being involved, and it, it, it can become quite quite ugly, you know, and you have to you you have to check yourself, I think, sometimes to not get caught up in the whole the whole process of um, it being about more than about just the music, really. But uh, he, but scene wise, he's you know he he helped push push the music forward for sure. And he, was, he was a big help to Napalm in those early years, acting almost like a kind of caretaker manager of us. You know, there was things that happened that just came uh, through to us. A lot of press, a lot of the BBC arena stuff. You know, you know they contacted Eric, and it was it was Napalm that he wanted to be the kind of to be the flagship for Eric, I suppose. At one point, so. You know, thirty-five years later, I'm like, well, you know, good luck to him, really. Yeah, he certainly certainly made a mark in a in a positive sense. And uh, yeah, I've just had so many conversations with with musicians. Some of it off the record, some of it on the record. Like with Mortis, he's out there with uh, with what his experiences were like. But uh, yeah, he's he's dealing with musicians to your exact point there. And God knows, I've been in enough band to know how bloody difficult dealing with musicians can be at the best of times. <laughs> I think it's. Well, I don't know, man. I mean, yeah, it's 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 very tricky. Uh, I, I think to, it'd be easy for me to say, well, blah blah this, blah blah that. But I also look at things differently from different angles, and I, I know, I know possibly how demanding one of our old managers might have been on him, you know, and, and how we were individually, you know, expecting, and perhaps you know, bands expect and. Thing sometimes you think you deserve. Well, mm, yes or no? I don't know. It's mm. tricky. Mm. And, um, so I think after such a lot, of, the important thing I think is his his labels moved on. You know, they do what they do. Um, we're doing what we do, and we're coexisting. All right, so let's leave it at that, mate. That's good. You know. Yeah. I'm hearing you. Yeah, uh, you mentioned Bill in there too, and I've had a couple of conversations. Bill Steer, sorry, that is, and. Uh, could, could you tell? Could you tell even back on the Scum days? Obviously, a very innovative guitarist. It goes without saying, but he practically certainly popularised. He might not have been the inventor, okay, but I think he's got some responsibility in the invention. Certainly, in that new wave of British heavy metal infused death metal sound that came about through Carcass, but also through that that gore grind sound that absolutely was pioneered through Scum. Did you? Did you look at him as a bit of an innovator back in those days, though? Like, could you tell he was the guitarist of the caliber that he that he is back then, or was he just no, another no, bloke no. in the band? Yeah, no, no, it was no. I, mean, I knew Bill before he joined Napalm um, because uh, the tale is it's not a tale. The story is this: there used to be a magazine called Metal Forces back in the day, and they had a thing called Pen Bangers section in the back. Mm. Me and my friend Mitch Dickinson we were like avid metal fans, and we we're like, we knew there was this whole scene of stuff we hadn't just got dis- discovered, and we came across some addresses. There was Ken Owens' address, there was Bill Owens' address, and uh, Bill Steers' address, and um, a couple of others. And so we wrote to them. We had a band called Warhammer, and for a band, Bill was into Warhammer. He played in a band called Disattack, kind of discharge kind of band. Um, but already he was what fifteen, already a shredder. You know what I mean? Pretty much. Already playing killer, killer stuff. He loved all that stuff. He introduced us. We um, we met each other. The Exodus geek. We played with them in '85. So I knew him for a good two years before he joined Napalm. You know, I mean, Napalm didn't really showcase his talents at all in some respects. You know, even though he loved that kind of stuff, 
Um, I think it's, you know, obviously Cock has invented, I guess, the gore grind sound, you know, based on we were all into repulsion and autopsy and stuff like that. Uh, but I think uh, as Cargos went on, they decided, you know, they, they made a conscious effort to go, well, you know, especially Bill. I also love heavy metal or Racer X, wherever else. He loved Racer X back in the day, stuff like that. And um, they integrated it into the band, which I think is a smart, heartfelt move, you know. Um, so, yeah, Bill was always a killer guitarist. And uh, we've known each other a long time, meaning. So um, I'm happy that Cargos have. Uh, you know, doing what they're doing well and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, it was always a great guitar. I was a great guitarist. I felt mm. somebody else that I really haven't seen you be asked about is Kevin Sharp. But I mean, he's been around as long as anybody as well. Different scene, being in New York there. But what are your what are your most prominent memories of working with him? Uh got millions of memories. Uh, you know, we 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 became friends. Um, in 89 on the Grand Crusher tour when there was Bolt Fro, Morbid Angel, Carcass and us. Uh, in New York, we used to hang out all that. Um, but lots of memories. Kevin's Kevin's been around for a long time, not just me in, 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 in bands, but also, you know, he was part of the whole uh, Relativity uh, label when they, when they, when Combat signed Earache for the States. And he was, you know, Multiverse musically, I guess, uh, and, and stuff, and and he's you know he's toned down over the years, like we all have. But um, I know we did it. I know we did. I don't know. I, I love love. We did some venomous rec- concert recordings once when he just drank this big tea little bottle of wine, and that was funny. Yeah, he always has this kind of like thing where he likes to have. There's always it's always apes always have a prominent thing in his in his artwork. Yeah, and I think he has right. kind of he kind of. It's his missing link, you know. So when he drank this wine, it was fucking raging in a good way, you know. But uh, yeah, I love Kevin. You know, we're we're we've, we're 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 brothers to be honest, really, and uh, we've had lots of good times together. Um, and he, you know, he's just uh, he's a good down to earth guy and knowledgeable. Um, and yeah, I mean, I've known him for God, yeah, I've known him for over thirty years. We bonded over. Great New York pizza. That's how we we, we, how we first met, and then um, took it from there. Really, you know, yeah. Yeah. The, th- the thing with you, though, it's almost easy to list the people at this point, prominent people. I'm talking about too, that you haven't worked with. I mean, you work with Pete Tagford, and you work with so many of these these people that are the leading lights of the genre. And you've been the bass player for so many killer albums as well. Is there is there anybody still on the bucket list that you'd like to work with? Um, well, yeah, but the, 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 there is. I mean, um, I was, I'm always hassling Patton from Faith No More, always hassling him. But, um, nice, I think, I think, uh, you know, he always kind of politely turns me down in a way. It, it, he's, a good, he's a good old boy, Mike, but, um, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, this, uh, it's, uh, I don't know, so it's, it's, he put me on the spot a little bit. God, if I was to say anything. I mean, it, it would never happen in a million years, but I'd love to work with Geddy Lee and Alex Lazer and Rush. That's who I'd love to work with. It'd probably never happen in a million years, but there you go. That's it's it there. Stranger things, mate. It's yeah, it's 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 I love Rush. I'm a massive Rush fan. And um, I kind of like they kind of, I always like the fact that they kind of push. Each album was always a little bit different than they always tried. Tried to surprise, you know. Mm. So that would be something interesting, interesting to do for me personally. Yeah. Do you do you have a favourite album that you've worked on? Oh uh, wow, well, God! It's um, I did like with outside of Napalm, probably the the, the Tronos album, Slash Steel Mechanics, which I did. Uh, it took ages for us to do that because that was kind of like we didn't know what we were doing, where we were going to go, I guess. And then, and then I started singing on the record. I never planned on singing, and Dirk played drums. Dirk who plays Megadeth now, and. I think uh, all, these, all these people just helped, kept, just jumped in and wanted to be part of the process. So I never expected, you know, Billy from Faith No More said, I'll play bass on a couple of tracks and Troy from Mastodon. And I didn't expect these people to sort of just, just want to be, do, want to do it. You know, and I, I, they're friends of mine. I look up to them. I admire them as, as musicians. And um, 
I was like, well, where lucky I am to be able to have cool friends <laughs> who want to jump in and help me do this record. Uh, so that was that was a that was a quite a, a good experience to do. And um yeah, that was probably one of my favorites. I mean, Napalm, I enjoyed doing the last record. It was, was a lot of fun. I mean, unfortunately, Mitch wasn't really around that much. He moved back to the States, and so it was me and Danny kind of like laying the groundwork musically, you know, and John was coming in. Um, with Russ, who's worked with us forever, uh, and that's that's what I love creating. So I'm looking forward to doing the next one, just to go in there. Almost, I have ideas of what I want to do, but also I have idea, uh, the idea of not knowing what to do. See what happens, because it's you know, as opposed to like I'm not in the '90s. We used to spend months and months rehearsing, which was totally fine and cool. Yeah, you know, we'd rehearse during the day and go for some beers in the evening. That was a ritual, you know, about me. me. Mitch and Jesse would, and you go to record the, the record, and then poor old Danny sometimes would get a bit nervous and we, he'd forget his parts. So I'm like, well, maybe let's just see what happens when we go in the studio and press record. That'd be more interesting, more fun, you know, things like that, which is kind of how we used to do it back in the day anyway. Who knows what was going to come out, you know? Hmm. What, what about the bass guitar? I, I know that's the instrument you're most closely associated with, of course. But you're actually a multi instrumentalist. You can drum, you can play guitar, and to your point, you can sing vocals too. How crucial do you think the bass has been to your creativity, though? Um, yeah, I think it, what's interesting with it when I was writing in the early days of Napalm, the songs were a bit more well, simpler, I guess, but you would write them on the bass, and that was interesting because I, I didn't have an amp. I'd just sit in my mom's bedroom, the bedroom of my mom's house, and go, you imagine in your head what you thought this was saying, like, and of course, when the guitar plugged in, of course, that's a different tone. You don't go on, you don't understand what these tones are really about then. You just know, oh, it sounds, oh, it sounds okay. You're hoping those those notes that you're choosing, not, not from, because you're not, I'm not musically trained, so you're hoping these notes have the right degree of savagery or darkness to them, you know? Um, and they do, and they did. So that, that, so that was interesting with the bass. And I think, you know, I originally got asked to play guitar for Nate Bomb and then kind of didn't do that and joined eventually on bass. So, you know, I've slowly, I hope, got better on the bass guitar. And, I, and it's only the, probably the past 10 years or so that I've really understood what a bass, in my opinion, you should do, which is to provide that backbone, that kind of, that that that, that body, that warmth, you know. Uh, but also sound wise it's quite unconventional because it's mixed with, 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 with the high-end high end distortion. You know, mm. and I play a little bit different. I play down the neck where you. So I didn't realize this. John told me. So I'm playing like here, you know, and um, I'm not, not by the pickups at all. I'm up here, which is a weird way of doing it, I suppose. You know, um, and I guess that helps the sound. But um, uh, it's a journey doing. You know, you, it's a journey that you do, and, and I wanted to be a guitarist, but. At the time, I almost had to watch other people to see what they were doing. To go, okay, that's how you do it, you know. And um, and yeah, it's 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 it's, it's great to be able to play a bit of guitar, do vocals. I, I know I do this kind of weird synth stuff that I like to do, you know. Mm. Um, so it can only be a good thing for someone like me who likes to um, create all the time, you know. Absolutely, yeah, it does. Um hinted something else though. you you talked about family uh, up top how how do you find you can balance everything out these days I assume your kids are young like what mine are I just find that I get to the about eight nine o'clock at night and I'm just exhausted after the working day and family stuff so how do you maintain yeah. your creativity around that uh well it was it, I mean I've managed to put out some records and do stuff quite a lot my wife's really understanding uh to be fair she is um and uh, my son's going to be starting school properly, I guess. So he's, he's, he's nearly five. My daughter's nearly ten. Hmm. She's you know, developed. She got. She's obviously a, a lot easier in some respects. Um, but um, yeah, you do find by nine o'clock you're knackered, <laughs> you know. And uh, but I, I, I think once, once my son starts starts in September, it's going to be good for me to like come down here around around nine and make music called. You have to do your emails. That, that, Sometimes, sometimes, as you know, it's like you can such bombardment. Try and try and get it all done. You're like, what the hell? You know, your brain's fractured totally. Um, 
Um, but I noticed that my family are away right now. It's incredibly quiet at home. You know, and I, I thought I was looking forward to it. And I'm enjoying it in some respects. I've had some horror film binge binges and <laughs> set up a few, few packets of biscuits that I should have done that kind of vibe. And, um, but at the same time, I'm like, where are they? They're not here. They're missing them a little bit, you know, and a lot really. And um, making it makes you realize, you know, that uh, you need, it's, it's nice to have that, that balance, you know, otherwise, mm. you know, being creative is a thing where you have to come away from it sometimes. Like a, you can sit there 12 hours making some music and sometimes it's not going to turn out any better. You have to walk away. So having that family, that balance to go to and, you know, bring you back down to the reality a little bit is good. But it can, it can be hard to find the time, that's for sure. Yeah. Only a, only a parent will understand this question, but have you gotten on top of the iPad thing yet or is that still the eternal battle? Uh, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's difficult. Um, my wife's very good, very good with it. I mean, they, they watch a lot of Japanese stuff too. Hmm. But my son is, it, it's, uh, my son has a little bit of a bit of eczema, you know, so he's, I find it distracts him a bit, but of course the wife's like going, you can't let him watch too much bloody iPad. And I'm like, well, I'm not really doing it for, for that. I get what you're saying, but then you've got to watch what's go- what's on there. That's the, you know, oh. what's coming through. And, you know, you get into YouTube and it's just like, it's the eternal, it's like, it's like, you know, you're clicking on one thing and then, what the bloody hell is that that's coming through? And boom, stop that. Because you it's just getting you know, the parental controls on there. And, um, and it can become, but it's, like, it's like addictive, isn't it? You, know, is. you, you, you didn't really have that at all, of course, growing up. Uh, luckily, my, my daughter's reading a lot, which is good. Um, you know, because uh, yeah, I think it's too easy to jump on that stuff now and just be. You, you, we all do it. You can just, you, know, you go on your phone, and you know, next thing you know, it's like, you know, you're, putting one, you're looking for one thing, and then 15, 20 minutes later, you're off. You know? Yeah, it's horrible. Yeah, they, I know. They, down the yellow brick road of God knows what, and you're like, what am I, what, what am I looking at here? It's wasting my time. You forgot what you actually jumped on the phone for in the first place. You know, it's, it's, um, it's trying to uh, separate yourself from that and try to get yourself back to real real life in some respects, I guess. Um, but it's difficult. Yeah. It doesn't it matter which a, country you're in. You know, I've spoken to everybody I've spoken to across the globe that's got p- kids our kids' age. From Iceland to the United States to Britain and Australia, we're all dealing with the same shit and these psychos that develop the algorithms in these, uh, especially these YouTube things and stuff, because that's the thing that they always want to go to, isn't it? To your point, there's been some disgusting things. As someone who grew up with satanic death and black metal, mate, I can't, I mean, that's one thing, but when you get all of this this fucking sexual, hyper-sexualized material aimed at girls, it's it's really evil. It's, it's it's very it's weird and, and it's it's, like, it's some stuff just sits, seeps in subtly. You're like, what the hell? Is, what the hell is it? You know, yeah. and then you know, it, you you do it. It's, no, it, it's um, it's a fucking this this is a strange world. It always has been a strange world, but uh, the power of technology is uh, going to test test people's uh, resilience a lot. I think in some respect, you know. Are you, are you, particularly your daughter, is she aware that her dad's pretty much globally famous? People are globally aware of the work that you do. She she, she knows, you know. Um, but this, I mean, she appeared. She she did some vocals. Uh, she sang on the, on the new Venomous concept album. She, that's my daughter on the beginning of the record. She okay. did that. The, um, but uh, she kind of like she juggles with it. I mean, my you know, my wife likes to remind me that you know, you know. Because you can, you can, you can be, especially when you do interviews a lot. Sometimes you come out of them and you go, you think you're in interview mode still. And my wife will definitely tell me, you're not doing a bloody interview now. You know, I'm like, that's right. You know, mm-hmm. uh, so it brings you back down to earth. But my, my, my daughter's aware of it. And it's interesting with the, the, the synth stuff, or whatever you want to call these weird sounds. I like my son is into that. But I don't, I'm not really, I'm not trying to push them in any direction because I'm more interested to just see how they, just see how they go, you know, and how they live their life. But mm. yeah, she 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 did this. She saw she saw us play a show a few years ago. Played a very strange festival in um south of England. It's called Camp Festival. So it's kind of more of a poppy indie festival, uh, but it's more aimed at families. So all families go. You know, it's pretty with massive bouncy castles and all this kind of stuff everywhere. So we played that, and then she came to, and the family was there. And, so that was good to see her 
this is what Bosch is like. But lately, she's, I don't think she's really been bothered lately. She's changing. You know? They change all the time, don't they? Yeah. You know? And, um, oh, yes. yeah. but, but then, but I could see, I mean, she musically, she likes all kinds of different stuff. And it's different when she's with her mom, she's different to me. Yeah, she's with me, you know, she's a bit more, a bit more crazy when she was with me. They both my kids tend to go a bit wilder when it's just the three of us. The wife's the bump. Yeah. You know? Sit down and pay attention. I'm a bit more like, let's go and watch Harry Potter, one to seven. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Sounds like my household, like... don't worry. <laughs> oh, no, I've tried. I've tried to indoctrinate them with rugby league and music and stuff like that. And they're, they're vaguely interested in rugby league. We go to the stadium, watch the Tigers play yeah. and stuff. But yeah. but they, um, they uh, in terms of the music and stuff, no, they're into, you know what they get into, mate? Probably like your daughter, Jay and K pop. That's the big thing now. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. It's huge. Yeah. Because she, well, because she watches a lot of Japanese TV, she's like, you know, uh, she goes to Japanese school on a weekend in, in England. She's about an hour away. So there's a, there's, she's great. They both speak through in Japanese. You know, she, writes, she, she can write it, she can read it. And, uh, oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, and I know very little. And I, 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 I note to myself to get my act together while they're away. I was all right. I can sit down in my Rosetta Stone and try and get my brain together with this. I, and then, um, uh, so that's always a challenge. I know, I know, I know what they're talking about. Now. That's about it. And um, so, um, uh, so yes, but she, yeah, she's got her own famous Japanese artist that she likes and stuff. She, but she's 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 into art a lot, which is good. I like that. She's kind of really creative with that. And, and they both will be creative, but probably maybe not in the music thing. It might be something else. You know, that's and that's all good. You know, it's, it's really, it's a it's a bit of an honor to watch them grow. Really, see yeah, how they develop. Yeah. No, I, no, I agree. You're about. right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, you're right. It's it's a massive honor and it's a huge responsibility that we've got, isn't it? Oh God, it's uh, yeah. The gravity of it sometimes you're like bloody hell, you know. Um, but then, but then of course, like I say now, when they when they're not here, I'm like, well, because I was like, I was itchy. I'm, I'm happy to have the time. Sort of, I'll just there with my cats, you know. <laughs> but um, but um, I'm thinking. And then of course I FaceTime and they're both fighting with each other. And I'm like, there's the noise I recognize. You know what I mean? There's the <laughs> there's the sound of the disagreements. She's she's taking something off him, he's getting pissed off. Um then you miss it really. So it's it's a good thing. It's good. Yeah. Do your uh, my, my my uh wife's father was from Croatia and he worked in the mines when he came to Australia and he really never learned how to speak English in a in a conversational way. He had basic sure, but in the household he would do this thing where he'd speak Croatian and my wife and the mm-hmm. other the kids in the household would respond in English. So they'd have this this conversation with two different languages. Does that happen with your wife and the kids yet? She speaks in Japanese to the kids and they, they answer back. Um and I think in the early years, it, it, I, I, I didn't really think about it. Lately, there was a brief period where I was like, I, it was kind of wobbling me a little bit. I'm like, what am I getting wobbled here for? So it's because you can't bloody understand it. That's why I get off your ass and start you know, getting your shit together, uh, which I did when I first met my wife. We moved to Japan. And, I, I thought I was going to move to Japan. And and then because my wife grew up in the States, she speaks English really well. Uh-huh. Um, so it was like, when I was going there all the time, everything was making sense, and then she, but she decided she wanted to move to England, and it was just we both became kind of well, she's not lazy, but you are talking English, you know? and of course the kids came along, and understand, understandably culturally, she's you know making sure they, they know a better culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but as things are moving with me, I'm like really going to sort of buckle down, and, and I, I, I can understand the gist, but it's it's I need to do, do better. But yeah, yeah, that's how it goes really, and then. Um, it, it, sometimes you know, like, trying to decipher what's going on because she'll be giving up, you know, she'll be bollocking my door. And I'm like, well, that's cool. Well, not cool, but, but uh, we need to deject here together, you know, to see what's going on, you know, with the, with that kind of vibe. So that's, yeah, it, it, it adds to the extra chaos, that, which is parenting, I think, probably. But, um, yeah. I guess some Japanese more than me, probably. But <laughs> there you go. <laughs> One thing you can tell your daughter that she would understand is that you had the president, I think it's a president of Indonesia, a prime minister or president either way, but huge fan of, of napalm death. Is that one of the more unusual things to happen to the band? It's definitely strange, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think he, he was, uh, I believe, you know, he's a, fan, he's a metal fan. Um, I've seen him with an A-bomb shirt on, which is, 
Yeah, there's a few pictures out certainly there. Quite a tri- certainly, certainly quite a trip in that, in that instance, you know. Um, and I guess uh, I think we might be going to maybe going to Indonesia in December. We haven't been there for a long time, but uh, you do come across, you know, in certain countries, obviously, politicians or you know mayors that tend to be. We've done, we've played festivals where the, the local mayor is a mad napalm fan, you know. And, Made sure that, that that gig happened for particular reasons. He, wants, he almost wants to bring the band over. So it's strange, uh, strange coincidences in some ways. And it, it's a uh, bit, it, it, it makes sense, you know, especially with the younger. You know, you always look at politicians as being these aged, kind of not with it people, I suppose, mm. you know, in a way. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a touchy subject, politics at the best of times. But uh, I think it could, be, it could be a good thing for some to hopefully have some influence from more subversive influences, you know, I guess. Mm. Yeah. Barney's really on the front foot about his views on politics. And I know you've you've politely declined, I think, in many instances to have conversations around it. Is it just that it's it's his thing and you you're happy to let him to be the spokesperson on it? Or do you have your views too and you prefer to keep them private? Um it, 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 it is really Barnes Barney's thing is the wrong way to say, but it kind of is. Um Napalm is, of course, always it's Napalm steeped in that anarcho punk rock history. Um, and my views, I don't know. I was thinking about actually this 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 morning. Uh, I would answer it really, but it, it's um, I think it's in, it's impossible for me to re-answer on the state of the world or what is done. And it's it, it's always been a, a moving force of many things and I, I just don't think I have any answers or maybe I do but I don't wish them to to be known in some ways because it's, it's I find it hard enough waking up in the morning sometimes and getting through that day me personally you know mm. um I'm creative musically and it, I, I try to express my things that way um and of course things come in from the, from Barney's world or our or a more a more Ethical, political, whatever kind of stance, which will, which would have bearing on me, but I would express that musically as opposed to lyrically, probably. Mm-hmm. When I write lyrics, they tend to, my lyrics tend to talk about deeper things that are personal to me, I suppose. And I'm happy with Bob to just let him, you know, do his thing on that, really. Um, which frustrates him, I think, sometimes, honestly. Yeah, he wants me to speak out, and I'm like, well, I don't know what to say in some respects, you know. Um, and in this day and age, not being afraid of what to say. So like, I just think, I don't know. I keep my my thoughts on my thoughts on certain things, you know. It's hard to keep anything private nowadays, possibly. So, <laughs> Especially when you're doing you lots of interviews like this, to your point, because what happens is because you're not known for your political statements, if you say one thing, that'll be the statement that's picked up on ultimate guitar and decibel or metal injection and blabbermouth, and that's what they'll run with because I've, I've had this conversation a lot with uh, people who listen to my show that, you know, these blabbermouths and stuff, they would ply and trade is hits and clicks because they want the advertising revenue and they use your quote as the bait, okay? And yeah. this is, we're finding this, I mean, it's been like this now for 20 or so longer, 20 or so odd years, but people don't seem to be as, or fans more specifically, don't seem to be as aware of it. And I'm always really careful about, I'm happy to make my own statements, but in, especially the sort of questions that I ask around that, because I am I get what what Bory and what Blabbermouth and the metal injections and what they, what they do and what they're all about. And they're not about hardcore journalism, unfortunately. They are... Uh, they, they pick up on whatever Dave Mustaine said about an air steward or whatever. Not that he said anything, by the way, but you know what I mean, like where he's headed. So. Yeah, yeah, well, well, yeah. I mean, but I mean, I, I yeah, and, and, I, and I do see that. You know, I see like the you know the, through the social media that oh, so and so said this today, and I'm like, well, you know, and I realise that is kind of how it moves. I mean, I do a lot of stuff on Instagram for whatever reasons. Really, sometimes I just do it because I feel like connecting. You know, mm-hmm. um. um but yeah, when it comes to like the, the state of the world and stuff, I, I'm like, well, or I don't as much the state of the world or what you know, what Russia's what what's happening with Russia and the Ukraine. I, you know, I, I tend to not really get into that because sometimes the answer is obvious. It should be obvious, um, but um, yeah, I mean, I I don't know. 
it, it, in this day and age, and it will become even harder to hold on to what's inside your head, possibly, you know. Um, yeah, a lot of the youth, though, mate, they're just not centrist. You know, the, the thing about us and when we grew up, you could, in the same family, you'd have conservatives and, and Labor voters, and that's certainly true of mine. And and within your friendship circles, you have the same, certainly musicians, you know, musicians are like most of hardcore sort of lefties or at least have that bent toward that way. But I just find these days too that that everything's so tribal and particularly on the left, it's so ideologically motivated that uh, you're almost not allowed or not, it, it's frowned upon to express yourself and that's the big issue. And I know you guys have sung about this or certainly mm-hmm. Barney's lyrics and probably your lyrics too, but the censorship side of things. But we're in an era where censorship is okay. Where it's cool, where it's not fuck you, don't do what I'm not going to do what you tell me. It's fuck you, do what the government tells you, and and it's such an yeah, odd yeah. place for us to be at. Yeah, and I think it'll probably get worse, um, unfortunately, um, and uh, whatever that worse may be. Um, yeah, it's uh, I don't know, it's it's uh, I, I I see it's which interesting points of literature written so long ago. That we seem to be entering into what was predicted by uh, just fiction writers in some respects. I find. George Orwell's uh, 1984. Yeah, have you have you read that recently? Have you reread it? Or I'd say you probably read it at school. But, yeah. yeah, and uh, it, it, I remember seeing a T-shirt. Of someone was saying, "What was it? I can't remember. It was 1984 was a book, not a manuscript or something. I don't know, something for like I don't know, almost like yeah. a, a doctrine for, for, for the future." And I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it's. Um, it's it's very bizarre times, you know. And um, but I mean, but even prior to that, I, I but I'm always it's great. It's creativity, you know. I take what's going on to push it, it into my music, really um, mm. myself, um, and that's key for me, you know. And what works for me doesn't always work for somebody else, you know. Um, and that's that, really. Yeah, and it's very interesting. Again, going back to kids, yeah, what do they, when they ask you questions, hmm. that's always the thing. I thought, what about this dad? And you go, hmm, interesting. Uh, and you know, me and my, me and my, I, you know, I, I live an alternative life, I suppose, in some respects, whatever you call that. And my wife's Japanese, culturally different from England, hmm. even though there's many cultures in England, but there's a lot of racism as it is everywhere uh, here, and she experienced. I mean, where 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 I'm where the, the napalm death house is in a very big Muslim area, hmm. um, and uh, but uh, as a young Japanese girl when she first came over, there's quite a lot of tension, which I never would have experienced, you know, uh, never thought. Um, and then you, you look at things from different, which you always we always try you always try to look at different different angles uh, from different points of view. Uh, and so when my children ask me questions, it's very hard to, to work out what to answer on, on things, you know. Um, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> I just, I always like, give, just give me the guitar and let me play some music, you know. That's so fine for me, really. Yeah. I know what you're saying, though, yeah, because especially with, I've got a 10-year-old too, I might have mentioned, and uh, 10 and 8 of mine, and uh, the 10-year-old in particular asks a lot of questions about these things. And, and the reason that they ask these questions is because they're watching a YouTube clip to our earlier point and just subject matter about trans lives matter or whatever it will be will come up and and in order to have conversations with them about it you've actually got to be informed you can't just make up your answer because then they go out to the real world with those things because they have their own conversations at school and the like so you want to arm them with enough information to be sufficiently informed for their intellect at their level of maturity but at the same time you want to protect them enough so as though they're not exposed to this stuff too early yeah yeah um yeah, it's, uh, it's the, the, gra- the gravity of being a parent for sure is uh, is daunting, and but that's what you are. You, you, you know, you, 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 it's to be responsible for your kids. So, mm. yeah, indeed. Yeah. yeah, I'll uh, if I've got time for one more question, I've got a good one for you for the, as the last one. Is that cool? Cool. Yeah, yeah. What do you hope the future holds? Key word there being hope. Uh, well, uh, depending. Uh, you look at hope. Some people say, uh, if you look at psych- if you look at it in Jungian psychology terms, hope was the last great evil that there in Pandora's box. How about that one for you? Um, but uh, we won't yeah, go there too much. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, for me, it's been like I said, like many people, I've had a, I've had a bit of a rough few years. Uh, uh, 
but that was probably, probably a lot of it self-induced in a year. Uh, and I'm happy to be creating music and, and to grow with my family, really. That's what's important to me at the moment, more than ever, I think. And uh, trying to find balance with uh, a good home life versus uh, still doing what I, what I want to do, which I've always done, really. Um, that's my, I guess that's the future that I'm thinking of, really. Um, and you take it day by day. It's, that's all you can do, you know. Past is the past. The future's not here yet, they say. you got to live in the moment. And that's the tricky part, living in the moment, you know. Mm. You start worrying about uh, what's coming around the corner. Well, you don't think you can do that, really. You know, you never know. Well, we might not wake up tomorrow. If that's the answer, that's all I can give you, I guess. No, it's a good one. Yeah, I, I just remember as a young fellow listening to your albums and the Morbid Angel albums and just uh, it never crossed my mind that I'd be having these conversations later on in my own life, yet alone that you as the musicians would be approaching and in some instances well into middle age playing extreme metal at the same intensity and extremity as what you did say, in, as I say, in some instances for, for you, it's 40 years ago when you started. Can you believe that? It's pretty nutty. Yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy because in my head, you know, I, you know, you, you, you feel uh, in essence uh, almost the same. Uh, but the, of course, the vehicle, the, your body, which you're in, you know, has a few, <laughs> more, creaks, a few more croaks and creaks. And uh, you know, some days you go, "God, where's that pain come from?" And as soon as bloody winter hits here in England, you're like, "Oh yeah, here we go." You know, the familiarity of uh, whatever the hell it is, and then um, seeping through your veins, and uh, but. Um, yeah, it, it, it's. Uh, I, I hadn't played shows for a while. I took a break and I did a show with Lockup, one of my other bands in uh, yeah, Denmark. A few years ago. And that was a lot of fun. It was. Um, we have two vocalists live now. We have like Kevin Sharp and Thomas from Lock uh, from Matt that. Yeah. So, mm. so that was a lot of fun. It was. We hadn't played for ages. And Adam, who's playing drums, was now from Pig Destroy, a new drummer. Um, he's a great drummer. And um, it was just. Uh, yeah, it was great to great to be doing doing it again you know um for me and uh, yeah you, you 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 wake up and you go well you know it's like i was 19 years old i joined a bomb death on 55 that's pretty nuts really when you think about it um yeah um yeah it goes by like that. it just goes by like that. Yeah. It does. You snap your fingers, mate, don't you? I, f I still feel like I'm in my late twenties, but I'm not. And uh, especially for you guys, you know, you got such it's such resounding as if success for what you're doing. Let's face it, what you're doing. I mean, who would have thought that all those years ago? Of course, you, you, the word career, and I, I remember Barney was really insistent that he didn't look at the band as having a career. It was something else that I can't remember the way he framed it, but he took not objection, not a, not exception, sorry, but he, he was insistent that he, he did not refer to what he was doing with the band as a career. But, you know, for all intents and purposes, that's what it resembles, isn't it? I mean, it's been your life's work. Yeah, it, 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 exactly. It, it does resemble a career. You, you, you look at it, you look at it differently in some respects. Um, and you can, you wrestle with those kind of, uh, Similarities, I guess, in some ways, because I have to explain to my wife sometimes. You know, she, when she, when she always talks to this, I mean, you're in your creating mode, you know. And I'm like, well, that's what I do. I goes, I, I, I love doing it. I'm, this is it's like a hobby. It's, well, it's my job, but I don't look at it as a job. But it's my hobby. It's what I love to do. And then you know, you start doing these things. You, you know, that's where that's where sometimes record labels can take advantage. And do because you know most when you start playing music, you, you're from the heart. You, you're not even thinking about a pound or the dollar or whatever. And and then you start if you have some success, you start making making money from it. It depends how you balance that with your head. Really, it's like yeah, we need to live. Money is energy, but we also for me, you know, I like to I like to think that the music we make is genuine and it's from and, and, and it's creatively inspiring. Uh, not just put out crap, you know. Um, so there's a process there, but yeah, uh, it isn't a career, but it, it's it, it, as you say, it resembles one completely. And it's, it's like, what else will I do? Oh, I won't have a fucking clue what else I was going to do, to be fair, you know. And um, and that is that, really. Um, so you, I feel quite blessed, I think, really, to be doing this. Were, you, were your parents really supportive of you back in those days? Because 19 is still very young. 
Um, yeah, my mum was really, really supportive. My dad was like, uh, he, you know, he, he had he had his visions. He was, a, he was an army guy, even though he even though he only played in the bloody military brass brass band. I used to like joke at him. I says, you know, he is a fuck, you know, he's a great trumpet player, amazing. But um, uh, and that's I guess that's probably where where some sort of musical uh, DNA comes from. But um, when the band became um, Known, I guess, and stuff. He he, he became. Well, he was always proud, I guess. But it it was like it was almost like because I think he, you know, a classic uh, thing where he almost he struggled. He found it hard to be a dad in his seventies. You know, he was young. You know, and we were, and I know. So I know I have, I have my kids. I know it's very tough for you because know, you you really have to be selfless and you have to put them first. You know, and. Um, and you wrestle with that sometimes, you know. You, you, you yeah, everyone wants to sit on the couch doing whatever they want, but can't always do that. But uh, they, yeah, they were they were, they, 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 were, they were supportive. Um, my mom especially, she played a lot of music, and she uh, she they used to come to shows, which is which is which is a trip, you know. They would come and see us, um, and yeah, and uh, I think. Um, that was that was important for me. Yeah, they let me have a drum kit behind the, the sofa in the living room. <laughs> just a big drum kit and piss the neighbours off, and then if the neighbours came and complained, my mum would just politely tell them where to go. <laughs> Which yeah. is quite funny. Young fell out of the Well, that's yeah, that's great. God, my mum used to tell me to shut up all the time with my basses and guitars and stuff. But uh, it's nice that you got that support, <laughs> that fostering. That's what it is. That fostering environment. She, she, yeah, she, she was pretty good at that. I mean, I, this this is a tale. Like, it's in the book that I got coming out in October, I guess. But um, oh yes, uh, I remember. Um, I came back from school once, and this Italian band called Bulldozer were put this record. I think it was a second album. I'm like, what the hell is that? How is that playing? Why is that playing? I've just come back from school. And, and I'm, I'm, my mum's like doing some cleaning upstairs. I'm like, did you put this record on? She's like, well, yeah. Well, why did you put this record on? Because oh, next door neighbours. She, 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 she had friends with the one side, but she hated the other guys. And they, she pretty loud. I'm like, so you put this on to piss your neighbours off? Yeah, really? I was just randomly put this one on. You know, she goes, oh, I quite like this one. I was like, you're you bullshitting me. You're trying to tell me that it's from downstairs in the kitchen. You picked this one. You like this one. You're really playing it, but you like this one. I'm like, mm, I don't know if I quite believe that. But I like the idea that she was annoyed with the neighbours and decided to put something on to, like, you know, give them a hard time. But she, yeah. Yeah, she, she, was, she, was, she was supportive supportive a lot of that. Um, she like she... I think even she can't. I don't think she understand it, but she she put, she she did support it. She she very defensive of people who are alternative looking, you know. And I think that was that's nice yeah, to have that. I guess. Yeah. yeah, that's nice. Yeah, it's lovely. Did you grow up? Are you Protestant or Catholic background? Uh, Chris, well, Christian, I guess. Uh, but we weren't really religious as such, you know. Um, mm. Uh, they kind of went to they went to church and they felt like it, you know. <laughs> I guess. Um, yep. And of course, I discovered that. And when I discovered that, and it was like, yeah, thank you very much. That's all out the door. And I, yeah, I got put. I, I, I dutifully carved my inverted cross at woodwork at school, and that was it. You know, <laughs> it was all game from then on. You know, all nice. game change there. But yeah, mate, that was brilliant. Yeah. Well, this has been a fantastic chat. It's great to finally catch up with you after all of these years. You know, I listen from afar and have this wonderful thing these days where I get to talk to so many of you, such as, you know, yourself, Barney, uh, Bill and uh, Carl and all these legends of British grind. And, you know, it's, I've, I've said something similar to Barker as well. You know, it's really important what you've done throughout the years. You know, it's been a... It's been more than an accompaniment. You know, the young guy, the young fellow like me in a boarding school, it was a friend listening to your music. You know that? And... Uh, <laughs> late at night, you know, and I'd, I'd listen to this stuff and I always used to have these visions in my head about actually watching a lot of the shows and just, you know, where you guys lived in far-flung England England from Australia and, yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that's that's what uh, when you, when it's, it gets connection, you know. It's, it's uh, when you get connected to music and, and yeah, I mean, I, I did this always the same thing, you know. We used to, I remember a small village. I used to walk around. Me and my friends would walk around discussing our lighting show. We were going to have a whatever band we were thinking about. You know, it's like it's going to be like this, and there's going to be this explosion. And we never did that particular band. Um, 
But um, yeah, it was, it, it's, it's, that's great. It's just escapism, but in a good way. Yeah, but you're being creative, even your escapism. And it's, it's it, yeah. I mean, that, that's good. And and then you know you. Sometimes you get the chance to go on stage, and it's just like, yeah, you go, oh well, that's interesting. And I'm sort of doing living the dream, I suppose. Yeah, and so it's nice. Yeah, yeah, indeed, yeah. Well, enjoy, I hope the trip's uh, not too punishing and not a bloody long flight down. I suppose you're flying into Perth first and then jumping across to Melbourne or Sydney, but uh hope that's not too punishing. Yeah. I'm going to probably pop over to Japan prior, quickly, if I can. Oh, okay. and, uh, there you go. See, see, see the family uh, before I go down because I won't see them for a while, um, which I haven't been to Japan for a long time either, so uh, that's going to be fun. Yeah. Trying to take my trying to take my son to see the seventy foot Gundam robot, which I've been seeing on on uh, YouTube. Right. It's pretty pretty insane. He probably blow his mind. You know, life size okay. giant robot. only in Japan, life size giant robot. You know, but there you go. So they do. But yeah, thank you, mate. Brilliant. Cheers. Absolutely, mate. All right. Well, uh, I'll be in the audience anyway, too, mate. So thanks very much, man. And chat to you again, hopefully. Cheers, mate. Take care. Thank you. Thank Cheers, you, mate. Bye bye. Well, there you have it, a conversation with the very legendary Shane Embry from Napalm Death. I really enjoyed that one there. It was fascinating to get his insight and have that conversation in regards to family and work-life balance. Just goes to show we're all people, no matter what you're doing with your life. If you've got a family, there's only degrees of separation there in so far as what we're managing and how we manage it. And it was great to get Shane's insight on that topic, in addition to so many other subjects related to his very long and storied career in extreme metal. So if you like that chat, there are a few more, many more as a matter of fact, just like it over at scarsandguitars.com. And if you like listening, perhaps you like reading. I've written a book. I'm partway through my next one as well, but my first edition that I released at, uh, was it February? Yes, it was my marriage anniversary, the 20th of February, 2022, the book was released. So it's been out for well over a year now almost a year and a half, yeah. Check it out because it, it goes into some detail. It expands on my thoughts and feelings toward many of the conversations that I've had for the Scars and Guitars podcast. You can always download a sample and if you like it do and complete the purchase, just hit me up because I want to thank you personally and so many of you have already done that and I genuinely appreciate it. Well, that's it from me. My name's Andrew Mackay-Smith. There's a bit more information to share with you about the book in the moment, but for now, I'll bid you a fond farewell. Adios. This is Eric Rutan of Cannibal Corpse. You are listening to the Scars and Guitars podcast with Andrew Mackay-Smith. I've been the host of the Scars and Guitars podcast since 2017. The first musician I interviewed for the show was David Vincent from Morbid Angel, and things have just snowballed from there. In all... I've posted almost 650 podcast episodes featuring conversations with many of the leading lights of rock, heavy metal and beyond. It just got to a point where I thought, I need to write a book about all this, so that's exactly what I did. In Scars and Guitars Volume 1, you'll read a heap of deep reveals and commentary, such as Des Fafara talking about Cold Chamber and why the band will never return. You know, if you're a, a band just starting out, you need to hear me. Do not start a band with partners. Ever. Yeah, wise, wise words there. Sage advice, mate, for anybody. Don't ever, because I, I can't go do Cold Chamber right now unless I get others involved. Phil Anselmo talks about the episode in his career, which gives him the greatest sense of accomplishment. I think the staying power of the, the fans and the staying power of the... I, of the songs, you know, whether it's Pantera, Down, or Superjoint, the fans remember the songs. Alex Skolnick from Testament confirms that, yes, playing the guitar in Ozzy's band is anything but an ordinary gig. Will Silent Oz from Demu Ball Gear write a book? Pa from Sabaton gives advice to people who want to start a band. Look at the team around you, look at the bandmates. If, uh, if the guys want to be on the stage, then it's all cool. If the guys want to be backstage, then it's not going to be cool. Current and former members of Cradle of Filth discuss the band's seminal 90s material. Read about the reaction to George Lynch and Mark from Suicide Silence's comments when they throw shade at then-President Donald Trump. We have this idiotic monster, you know, this egotistical, self-aggrandizing 
complete piece of shit in there. I, I, I just I just can't understand how we've gotten to this place. And yeah, we kicked a hornet's nest with Sepultura. Percussive overlord Gene Hoagland talks about recording with Chuck Schuldina. Chuck was always, um, you know, he was he was very, you know, very open-minded, and and he was into having his his musicians that were playing with him just reach out for for the best stuff that they had. Phil Campbell from Motorhead discusses what it takes to get sober. John Five answers his critics who dismiss his tenure with Marilyn Manson. You know, my name is John Five, and Manson gave me that name, and um, I had some of the best years of my life in that band and, and learned a lot. And we get the lowdown on Trey Zagtoth from those who would know, including his mother. All across Scars and Guitars Volume 1, there are moments of tension, relief, tragedy, exhilaration, and throughout it all, you'll obtain insight that I believe no one else has managed to obtain from many of your favourite artists. So treat yourself. Scars and Guitars Volume 1 is currently available as an ebook with a print edition on the horizon. Follow the links attached and download a sample. I'm sure you'll be compelled to read the whole book. <laughs>